Um, in the past, I've done presentations uh, involving very you know, nicely presented PowerPoints and animations of things and little jokes and stuff like that. But I'm afraid today all you've got is me in this very boring room with a shelf of books, which, let's face it, isn't going to impress anybody. Uh, and, well, you won't get invited onto Newsnight with that, let's be honest. I'm basically going to do it more in the style of a show and tell and essentially me ranting at you for about 15 or so minutes. So let's kick off with a quote from Mary Seton, who most of you, if you know her at all, and I don't know her well, um, probably because of an interest in Sergei Eisenstein or Satyajit Ray, would be my guess. But this is what she said in 1937 in Sight and Sound in an article about the beginnings of cinema in Britain. Writing about cinema, his the history of cinema, is like walking on quicksand. One is up to one's knees in inaccuracy before one suspects that one is on dangerous ground. Registration of a new but never exploited patent may be brought forward. Someone with a better memory than one's informant may dispute the dates. An older film or a more ancient piece of apparatus may be unearthed in a junk shop. The most a cinema historian can do is to sift as carefully as possible the data which he has been able to collect, either from men who were on the spot, who of course may twist the truth to suit their own ends, or from official statements, which may for diverse reasons depart from the truth. And although she was writing in a point in time when people like Robert Paul and Cecil Hepworth and Louis Lumiere and others were still alive, um, nonetheless, the problems are kind of exactly the same now. It's, it's the words that people said about themselves and then the words other people claimed on their behalf, which kind of leads me to the title of my talk, which is The Dangers of Dogma and Untangling William Freeze Green. Why particularly William Freeze Green? Well, as some of you know, I'm about to embark on a PhD about the work of William Freeze Green after years of on and off research. And I found that researching into him has been an incredibly sobering lesson in the dangers and the risks of taking overly dogmatic approaches, because basically pretty much all that's out there about Freeze Green uh, is very dogmatic in one direction or another, which is phenomenally unhelpful. And for me personally, this has been a great teacher in a way in terms of trying to find out for myself what is actually required to carry out research which is as free from biases as, as possible. So, William Freeze Green, there he is looking very handsome. There he is as a young chap, also looking pretty handsome. Um, now, why am I so interested in him? Well, now I'm not going to actually talk a lot about what William Freeze Green did. Uh, basically because there isn't time and because there's a lot of stuff out there right now. If you go on YouTube, Google William Freeze Green or just Freeze Green, you will immediately find uh, the event that happened with the Cinema Museum on the Kennington Bioscope channel where I spoke, and Ian Christie and Stephen Herbert, which I think is a very good introduction. You will also find a one hour interview that I did um, for Bristol Ideas in which I talk more about Freeze Green's life and other things about him. You also find a talk that I gave a couple of years back called Freeze Green and the Art of Collaboration. And importantly, you'll also find a reconstruction I did of the King's Road film, which you should really take a look at. Now there's a lot of talk. Now, why am I personally interested in Freeze Green? I should say, well, okay, there's a lot of talk about how the magic lantern tradition and its technology connected to the beginning of moving pictures. But I can think of few people who more clearly embody this than William Freeze Green, because he started off by meeting this guy, John Rudge in Bath. And together, they were doing these things with magic lanterns to make photographs move. And then I can't really think of anybody else who at the end of 1889, beginning of 1890 was actually showing to the world a camera for motion pictures, a film camera, which was remarkably, in many ways, like those cameras would be um, in the future. And that's of interest to me. And also, it looks like in 1891, he was already punching holes in his film, and uh, he was uh, moved on to a square format, to a more rectangular format, more or less academy ratio, as we would call it. Uh, and he was experimenting with projection. And all of that also seems to be of interest to me. But above all, I've got a personal curiosity about him as an individual because he, he made and blew a couple of fortunes. I mean, we are talking literally about millions of pounds, um, all because of his obsessive inventing, and somehow remained eternally optimistic whilst encountering a series of disasters in his life. Now, in terms of the modern history of British film, obviously, as has been stated, you know, 
this is kind of where things really, really started of maybe our era with John Barnes. But for me, there is another book, which is also incredibly important in pointing the way as the kind of research that's necessary. And that is this, The Edison Motion Picture Myth by Gordon Hendricks. I'm being naughty there, slipping a bit of America into this. And what both of these books demonstrated is that in order to understand the subject properly, you have to be willing to kind of get, get the dirt under your fingernails. You've got to be willing to kind of really sort of dig around and dig stuff out. And not just that, you, you need to research very widely and you need to be willing to do it by a variety of different methods. And what that can reveal is a radically different story to the accepted narrative. And yet in the 60 years since the Edison Motion Picture Myth was published and the 45 years since John Barnes began publishing, when so much new thinking actually has gone on, there's been almost no new thinking whatsoever about free screen. And I feel that's because generations of film historians have been unable or unwilling to see past the dogma. Now, free screen's greatest champion, no question, was this guy, Will Day. Now, Will Day knew free screen uh, and quite significantly helped him out at a very difficult time of his life during the Great War when his family was in a state of poverty. And possibly because of that, he felt this very strong emotional connection with him. But the thing is, Will Day was this visionary collector of the history of cinema. Um, he saw just 25 years in that it was important to, to keep things, to keep a record. And so he found he put together films and apparatus, all sorts of documentation. Uh, and not only that, things tracing back uh, where moving pictures came from. Uh, he had an extraordinary collection of rare books which were valuable in themselves. And his collection, a lot of it, was in the Science Museum on definite loan for, thir for, on and off for 37 years, but sadly ended up in the Cinémathèque Française instead of remaining in Britain. And within it were a number of things to do with Freeze Green, which he greatly prized. And it was Will's Day's eagerness to champion Freeze Green, which unfortunately led him to also be one of the biggest myth makers. And then, of course, in the interwar period and then the post-Second World War period, the story of a great British inventor was incredibly appealing. Um, so appealing indeed that uh, somebody wrote a book about it in 1948, Freeze Green, Close Up of an Inventor, uh, which really more, more told you about his life and him as a person. It, got a lot of things wrong about actually the details of inventions when he actually did things and so on. And then when the Festival of Britain rolled around, look at that, Festival of Britain ashtray. I can't say I'm not giving quality illustrations. Um, it was chosen as a subject matter to be the film industry's contribution in the form of becoming the magic box. Yup, there it is. And although the film's producers and writer went absolutely out of the way to make clear that they are not saying that he's somehow the inventor of motion pictures, that is how a lot of people took it and got very annoyed about it. And it seems that the person who was most enraged about it was a young man named Brian Coe, who'd come straight out of his degree at university into a job working in the research and library section of Kodak in Britain. Uh, and he and his boss, Rolf Schulze, who'd just been appointed curator, as Brian Coe later would be appointed when Schulze retired. In 1955, well, in fact, 1954, really, they decided to go on a rampage, really, the most extraordinary campaign leading up to the centenary of the birth of William Free Screen to ensure that it was not celebrated. This included claiming that they had proved that his camera didn't work. Um, and they told this to the British Film Institute, who then told it to other people who were considering doing things. The Royal Photographic Society, of whom Free Screen had been a significant member, stepped away from having an involvement as well. Um, and I've actually checked up on what they did, the supposed experiment. It, it's, frankly, it's a piddling bit of nothing that doesn't demonstrate anything, um, much less resemble a camera mechanism or, an, in fact, an, an entire camera. Uh, furthermore, the replica was built of the camera, which in which that part of it worked. And furthermore, as Stephen Herbert has pointed out, the same principle was later used in things like the Lepiploscope, uh, which were commercially sold and worked. And most devastatingly, Co published an article in the British Journal of Photography entitled, The Truth About William Freeze Green, The Truth. And in it, he essentially said that um, William Freeze Green was a scientific nincompoop who... Uh, stole other people's ideas, passed them off as his own, 
and it didn't contribute anything to the development of moving pictures. And to do this, he claimed it was entirely adequate to consult a very, very narrow range of sources, yet come up with definitive and wide-ranging conclusions. And surprisingly, generations of film historians seem to have thought it wasn't worth questioning that as a method. And even in 1995, when the cinema centenary rolled around and the whole load of themed plaques were being put up, Bristol applied to put one up to freeze green, and it was turned down by the BFI on the basis of all these things that have been said before, 40 years later. So at the age of around 23, 24, when Brian Coe had certainly not yet had the time to really study the subject matter in breath, in depth, he, he, he was elevated to being this kind of expert on it. Well, I mean, and, and in a way he was, I guess, um, compared to other people. Um, I'm not saying that he wasn't a good researcher in many ways, but nonetheless, what he wrote is full of the rush to judgment and con absolute conviction in one's own absolute rightness that one associates with youthful enthusiasm. The only problem is that in the ensuing 40 plus years of his career, he didn't revise his ideas at all and kept republishing them. And I feel like Brian Coe sort of aspired to the kind of research that John Barnes and Gordon Hendricks carried out, but without actually really doing the hard work. Indeed, he had the cheek to be rather snooty about Gordon Hendricks, saying that some of his judgments on technical matters seem to indicate a limited experience in this field, whereas in fact it was Coe himself who, in the very things he wrote about Freeze Green, took the lies that Edison and Dixon told about what they'd done and when they'd done it, treated them as gospel, and re regurgitated them wholesale. And this is what I noted to myself about Brian Coe's writings uh, when I was just thinking about this talk. I wrote down, I said, Coe is full of value judgments presented as fact, obvious conclusions that do not stand up to scrutiny, the deliberate exclusion of materials that would cast a more positive light, constant selective quoting to disfavour Freeze Green, lingering on failures whilst excluding notable successes, and confounding inventions which Co knew to be distinct to create a negative impression, and above all excluding the King's Road film. Those conclusions are most neatly summarised in this book, The History of Moving Photography, which it's probably the most known version of these writings because it's been pretty much all major public libraries. I'm sure in most university libraries and many people online right now have a copy of this on the bookshelves. And he he put a couple of pages about a bit more about Freeze Green in here. And um, I think it neatly summarizes everything that he had to say. And since Brian Coe took the trouble to uh, look at close up of an inventor and pick it apart from the errors but really, quite justifiably, I thought it's only right that I should do the same for Brian Coe. So I have um, gone through what he wrote in there because it's a good summary and I've annotated it. And that is now available online on Academia. If you wish to go and look, you can just download it. Uh, in, only about a thousand words written there are Brian Coe's own statements. And uh, I've had to annotate 30 errors within those just to give you some idea of the scale of errors. But to return to my title which is the dangers of dogma. William Freeze Green kind of suffered double jeopardy on this because on the one hand, first of all, he was taken as his nationalistic hero. And then on the other hand, there was this attempt to demolish his reputation. Now, a very typical thing is, you know, somebody gets championed because of, fam because of family trying to write the history or because they come from a locality, because they're from Leeds or because they're from Bristol or because they're from Lyon or wherever it might be or because they're from France, or because they're from Germany, or because they're from the USA, or whatever. Now, there's nothing wrong with being excited about somebody because they're in your family, or they're in your city, or they're in your country, just so long as you don't end up believing that their greatness is founded on those facts, or their importance is founded on it. And I would like to think that most of the people listening in today have moved well past that. I'd like to think that, but I can't always feel sure, because as some people will know, I recently in my blog had a go at Thierry Fremont, the director of the Cannes Film Festival, also the Lumiere Institute, um, for regurgitating what was, for me, just the worst kind of nationalistic nonsense of the kind which really you could have heard a hundred years ago from all day, really just the same stuff. Now, I can understand Brian Coe's reaction to all of that. I can empathize with it. But just because Freeze Green was built up for the wrong reasons, doesn't mean that knocking him down for the wrong reasons was okay. Because in the end, anti-nationalism can be as problematic as nationalism if it's not fully informed by the available facts and everything starts to get bent out of shape. Now, 
as an example, perhaps, of that, after the Will Day collection was sold, shortly afterwards, Brian Coe wrote about it. And bizarrely, given the huge scope of the collection, he actually spent most of that space going on again about Freeze Green and Will Day's obsession with him. In this article, he said that the purchase price of £12,000 he wanted was too high and that it had been reliably valued at two to £4,000. Now, this isn't actually quite true. Kodak USA had offered £5,000 for the collection and been turned down. Kodak in Britain had also done an assessment with the Science Museum and come, in 1948 come up with an assessment of three to 5000 And Kodak offered the higher value, but were turned down, it would appear. In 1953, the curator of the Science Museum, Alexander Barclay, who dealt with these matters, wrote a long and quite impassioned letter to the director of the Science Museum to persuade him to, to take measures immediately to keep the collection in Britain and recommends very strongly um, taking on board more of the collection and lobbying in the next year's budget to find £2,000 to put as a down payment towards £10,000 ultimately, which might be found from multiple sources to keep it in the UK, which would be acceptable to Will Day's widow. The director immediately responds positively to take action on this. Then everything goes quiet for three years. And in 1958, we find this note from Alexander Barclay. This project was left in abeyance, although it was agreed that the Will Day collection in the museum was a valuable one historically and one which we could ill afford to lose. It was thought that it could wait until a more favourable time finally presented itself. Precisely a year later, the collection was suddenly withdrawn and never seen again in this country. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, Brian Coe lost us a Will Day collection. That would be ridiculous. It was a very long running saga. But between, but just at the point that Alexander Barclay needed to make the case to actually get the money to start the process of securing it, exactly at that point, Rolf Schulzer and Brian Coe went full frontal against Freeze Green, who was closely associated with the collection, for better or worse. And it's also clear from what Brian Coe said that it, he and probably they he was that he's representing Kodak, had the most negative possible view of the collection and it valued it the least of anybody. And if you want to read the whole saga about all this, and Stephen Baltimore actually has written about it, but one cannot ignore what the effect of these loud and clearly, from what we saw in 1955, influential voices being so negative about all of this might have had on this process. I think it is worth stopping for a moment and wondering about that. And I think that this is a very good example of the dangers of feeling the need to take a position and then entrench yourself in it. Will Day and Brian Coe are great examples of just clinging on to an idea, and refusing to let go, no matter what. And my view of this is it is far better to hold your theories lightly. And when I was thinking about this talk a few weeks back, I was walking in Epping Forest, and uh, as I was thinking, I, I thought, what am I doing? And I was doing what I always do, which is I come off the main path, start cutting through through the forest, start trying to find new ways through, start trying to find new things, kind of following my nose, sometimes ending up somewhere I can't go any further, and sometimes discovering new connections between one place and another. And I thought, well, this is exactly what I do when I'm researching, isn't it? And I wrote this little message to myself which was the relaxation and joy of embracing new information that undermines your own theories. Because if you're going to have a theory, and we all have working theories as we're going, well, a theory is something provable or disprovable. So if you really think you've got something, one of the things I do is I go and look for what would prove it wrong. And sometimes you find it really quickly, in which case, well, fair enough, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree, no point wasting time on it, better that you found out quickly. But other times... What you find is new discoveries which make you realise it's more complex, it's more nuanced. In fact, maybe things are going in a different direction. Because people have been so sceptical about William Freeze Green, uh, I have tended to apply scepticism to other things, but not, but I would say a healthy scepticism, which is say a questioning mind, which is not the same as a refusal to admit new information. And I, and I kind of refuse to take sides. I mean, I've been looking a lot recently at Robert Paul and Bert Akers and... and, and uh, I don't see any need at all to take sides or take some sides and debates or take another. You know, it's entirely the case that Robert, Robert Paul could be a very ruthless man 
in the business and that Bert Akers was a kind of proud, stuck-up prig who probably annoyed the hell out of me and that's not surprising that there were explosions when he put the two of them together, but you don't have to. You can take an overview instead of taking sides. Um, and the possibilities that digitization have opened up, the possibilities of knowing information such that we can, in many ways, know more, going back to what Mary Seton said at the beginning, we can almost know more now than people 100 years ago who were talking about like 25 years since the moving picture industry began. And that means that we have a better chance than ever to be guided by the information rather than feeling this need to simply take positions. And I think that is in that way that a new picture of the beginnings of cinema in Britain can emerge. Thank you very much for listening.